Now, throughout this election campaign, we've been asking you to let us know about the issues you want us to look into. For example, we heard from some of the victims of the equitable life. Well, around a million people in Britain have seen the value of their pensions collapse and they've still not received any compensation. Tonight's big question is how will the different parties help them? There are as many as 100,000 people in this region affected by the near collapse of equitable life. I travel to Brockford in Suffolk to meet one of those who wrote in asking what the parties are going to do about it. Ron Orwell is a 78-year-old former chartered surveyor and civil engineer. He paid into Equitable for many years and looked forward to a decent pension income. But he and his wife Margaret are only getting about a third of what they expected, a shortfall of about £5,000 a year. It means that I haven't got that amount of money to play with and uh, I can't really and truly do things that I would like to have done. The money is still, still being reduced. The pension is, is yearly being reduced. Equitable got into problems by making promises it couldn't afford to keep, so payments to people like Ron had to be cut back. Over the last 10 years, many court cases and inquiries have been held. The parliamentary ombudsman has recommended that compensation be paid, but to date the government hasn't coughed up. Another policyholder to write in was William Atwood, who asks which of the three parties will commit to compensate equitable life victims. Well, Ron, I've had a look at the manifestos. The Conservatives and the Lib Dems both say they would set up compensation schemes. Labour doesn't make any mention of equitable in its manifesto, but it is talking about setting up what it calls a fair ex gratia payment scheme. What do you think of all that? Well, I'm encouraged by the Liberal and the Conservative Party's commitments. But as far as Labour is concerned, I've made no commitment. And I don't believe they are making any commitment whatsoever. It's reckoned 15 of Equitable's pensioners die every day waiting for justice. After a long, long wait, Ron and Margaret want to see prompt action. Richard Bond, BBC Look East, Brockford. Well, in racing, it's one of the highlights of the British calendar tomorrow. The 1,000 guineas at Newmarket. And one filly is ready to challenge the elite. Now, a good filly can cost a million pounds, but not this one. Blue Maiden cost just 6,000 pounds, and that's a real bargain. Charlie McBride's yard. Small, family-run, not glamorous. This, the grafting end of racing. But out of the blue, a real gem. Blue Maiden costing just six grand. In this industry, that's peanuts. Every year I have that problem. I always go to sales and buy cheap horses. And that's the way it is, I'm afraid. I live on the bottom rung of the ladder, so I have to try and get some bargains every year. And uh, this is a complete nutter dream for me. She's a fantastic filly. Charlie's never had a runner in a classic. Now he's got two, ready to race in one of the most prestigious meetings of the season. Audacity of hope in the 2,000 guineas tomorrow, Blue Maiden in the 1,000 guineas on Sunday. It's very, very hard to, to even get a one horse capable of competing at Group 1 level, let alone two. It's from a small 20-box yard, it's nigh on impossible. So this is a miracle. This is where the action takes place, the Roly Mile, racing's most famous mile, which on Sunday stages the 197th running of the 1,000 guineas. And if you're lucky enough and good enough, you could end up here in the winner's enclosure with the famous trophy and the lion's share of the £400,000 prize money. Yes, racing has a reputation of being a rich man's sport, and it's, it's just perfect that the small owner, the small trainer, can get a horse good enough to run in one of the classic races. Uh, trying to get to this level over 40 years has been, it's really, it's really hard work. We've worked hard all our lives. And to get at this level is just, well, I suppose if she did run very, very well, I'd be very emotional and I'd probably be in tears, you know. Ignored by others. Yeah, yeah, cracker. Adored by Charlie. His favourite, hoping for a maiden classic win. Tom Williams, BBC Look East, Newmarket. And wouldn't it be just great if he ended up in tears after the race? <laughs> no. We're now to a story about a pilot, a passion, and a very special Spitfire. Nick Grace was the pilot, and his passion was Spitfires, which was why he bought one in pieces 
and set about rebuilding it. It finally flew again 25 years ago. Well, sadly, Nick was killed in a car crash not long after, but his family have managed to keep the Spitfire flying in his memory. Its home is now a former airfield in Suffolk, and today Kevin Birch saw her take to the skies. She's now 66. She was the first Spitfire to shoot down an enemy fighter on D-Day, and she means everything to Carol and Grace and her family. You just look at her and it just brings pleasure to you and then when you wheel her out that sort of excitement begins to stem through your system really. She's never lost that. It's amazing after um, all those years of, of seeing her, uh, she still holds that same, same moment of joy when I see her. For Nick Grace, restoring the Spitfire was a labour of love. In 1985, with the work complete, he took Carolyn up for its first flight. Today, 25 years on, Carolyn, herself a qualified Spitfire pilot, is about to go up again to mark that poignant anniversary, this time with son Richard. You're flying with mum. D d who controls things? Um, I think because I'm sitting in the front, it'll hopefully be me. But I can tell you that if I get anything wrong, she'll be the first to pull me up, but there you go. She's a backseat driver. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> um, no comment. <laughs> I've been through quite a, <clears throat> quite a lot just to get it to this stage and Nick wanted it to carry on and, and it has. <laughs> After that flight in 1985, they cracked open the champagne. Today, they did it again to toast 25 years to toast Nick's legacy. Kevin Birch, BBC Look East at Bentwaters. Some great pictures and a great sound, isn't it? Yeah, makes. yeah absolutely. Now, what's the bank holiday going to be like weather-wise? Here's Phil to tell us. A mixed bag, Amanda. I'm sure you're already aware now that it does look rather changeable this weekend. It's down to an area of low pressure that's been extending in today. It's brought this little front towards us today and it's also brought a scattering of showers and some of those showers are still going to be with us through this evening into tonight. We start off with a real rash of showers pushing through from the west. They will gradually become more isolated through the night but still the chance of one or two quite sharp ones even as we head through towards the uh, dawn period. So fairly wet at times. The only benefit of having cloudy skies is that it should stay fairly mild. Overnight lows of 6 or 7 degrees Celsius and a little bit of breeze in there that'll help to keep any frost out of the way. For tomorrow, we've still got that low pressure with us. We've also got this front slinking slowly southwards, and I think that brings the prospect of some showers, if not a spell of rain, later in the day. If you're heading out tomorrow, I think the morning is the best time to be out and about. Any early showers getting away, some sunny spells for a time, and then the showers get going again as we go through into the afternoon, if not a longer spell of rain starting to develop as we head through towards tea time. Temperatures will be a little down on today's values, but still not doing too badly, 16 or 17 degrees, and with a gentler westerly breeze, that still shouldn't feel too bad if you're getting out and about tomorrow. Bank holiday uh, Sunday, though, not looking too good. This little area of low pressure is close to us. It'll stay with us for most of the morning, and then the rain will gradually push away to the south during the day. A little bit better for the Monday. I think we'll get away with uh, one or two showers, but we will also have quite a keen northerly wind blowing in, and that is going to feel rather chilly. So to put a little more detail on that, it's going to be a cool day on Sunday. Highs of only 11 degrees as opposed to 18 that we saw today. A little bit milder perhaps on Monday, but you've still got quite a noticeable north or northeasterly wind, and that will make it feel rather chilly. And then things improve slowly as we go through into the week. It becomes brighter for Tuesday and Wednesday. The winds ease down, and we get some higher temperatures as well, up to 15 degrees by the time we get through to Wednesday. The overnight temperature's not falling too far, but with lows of 3 degrees Celsius for Sunday and Monday, still feeling rather chilly. There's your weather. Oh dear, thank you very much, Phil. That's it. Have a great weekend. Good night.